Um, so let me remind you uh, what we did last time. I, I did the bicycle tire experiment, and I want to go back to it now that you've had some time to uh, let it sink in, because I only gave you half of the story. We're going to see today that it's a little more complicated than, than we led on. So uh, again, the way we kind of approach solving the evolution of a system is that we write the first law as a differential equation. And in principle, you should put all that in terms of variables of the system, and then you solve it. And we did that for an, for an adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas, where we knew how to turn these things into variables of the system. Right, but in, in for the adiabatic expansion of the ideal gas, we could say that this is CVDT uh, because it's adiabatic, it was zero. So we just had del W, which was minus PDV, right? And again, that's the important statement when you actually solve that problem uh, because after this, this is just variable manipulation to get to the solution, which told us what the final temperature is. And you can write this in many ways because you can substitute uh, uh, variables. So in some books, you'll see solutions with V. In some, in some books, you'll see relations with P and V, between P and T, et cetera. Um, so a few important physical concepts to remember, right? So um, what this indicates is that when the pressure drops adiabatically, the temperature drops, right? So you can cool things without any heat flow, right? Uh, the opposite is true, right? That you can heat things without any heat flow. If I raise the pressure, then the temperature goes up. Um, and this is often seen in a lot of applications. Actually, the, the biggest, not really applications, is uh, in nature, right? When uh, air rises up a mountain, um, um, it undergoes an adiabatic expansion because the pressure goes down and therefore the temperature goes down. And that's one of the reasons, not the only reason why it's colder on top of mountains than uh, on the bottom because you've had quite a bit of adiabatic expansion of air. Um, it's also why it rains a lot if you're on the wrong side of a mountain, right? If, um, let me erase this here. Anybody from the Washington area, Seattle, Portland? That's not the Washington area, no. Nobody from there, okay. If the Pacific Ocean is here, right? Uh, moist air comes off the ocean, rises up. If the air is saturated, temperature drops on the top of the mountain. So what happens? Saturation pressure drops and it starts raining, right? So that's why basically if you live near a mount the ocean side of a mountain, you get a lot of rain. What happens when you live on the other side of the mountain? When you live on the other side of the mountain, the air compresses again because it goes down, right? So the pressure increases. So the temperature goes up of the air. So what do you have here? Here you have desert, right? Because it never rains there. And so the appearance of desert on the inside of mountains is largely a thermodynamic phenomena that the rain never gets there because for for saturated air from oceans to make it there, it has to go over a mountain, which is a, means it has to decompress. And that means the temperature drops and the water all falls out. So for those of you in the US, this is why Nevada is a desert, right? And Nevada is essentially surrounded by um, mountains from most sides. So you can actually never get any moist air there. Um, it's technologically a big deal for reasons that I told you, uh, people who wanna store, um, energy in compressed air, their biggest problem is not the compressor technology, it's the heat management, right? That if I compress air, then uh, the temperature goes up, right? Uh, and so either I have to store the compressed air as hot air, which means over time, it gives energy off to the environment in which I store it and I'm actually losing energy, or instead of doing this adiabatically, I try to do this isothermally. And if I do this isothermally, then I have to get heat out, right? So the only way to keep the temperature constant is to get heat out. 
But the problem is if I let that heat dissipate in the environment, then I've lost energy. So it's an energy storage mechanism that isn't working very well because I'm losing part of my energy. So this is the biggest problem of um, compressed air uh, energy star, uh, technology. Um, I want to go back to this adiabatic expansion here because we made a few assumptions that I want to go deeper into. Okay. So when I write that the U is del W and which is true, right? This is true adiabatic. And then I write that this is CV dt and this is minus PDV. Um, if you remember, what I said is that this is an exact differential. So this is not path dependent. But this is path dependent. How do I really know what path depend what path it took? And what if you don't know what path? Again, if I had a, tur a fairly turbulent expansion that worked with the Gradient of pressure here, there's some boundary being displaced. Then, how do I actually know what the work of expansion is? Right? Is it this pressure? If I look at this gas, or is it that pressure? And here you could actually make an argument if this is really sort of a clean macroscopic wave, you could probably make an argument, well, here it's this pressure and here it's that pressure. Which means the work that I deliver here is not the work that's received here. Which means that I have to have dissipated something in between, right? Because I, I transfer more energy out of the gas here than is coming into the environment here. So this can get worse, right? If you have a sort of turbulent expansion. If I um, set up a chamber with a partition where e, here I have a, a, a high pressure and here I have P equals zero and I pull this partition suddenly. So I just pull it out. Let's think it's like a little drawer that I pull out. You know, this isn't going to sort of be a clean, gradual expansion. The gas is just going to flow very turbulently. And so at any given time, I cannot say what the pressure is. So I can actually not do this integral in that case because I don't have a path. And since that integral is path dependent, if I don't have a path, I cannot do that integral. So what do you do then? Well, first I want to give some nomenclature and then we'll go into how you solve problems like that. So the nomenclature that's used in thermodynamic on processes is that we distinguish what are continuous quasi-static processes from processes that are discontinuous. So in a quasi-static process, you can at any given time define the state variables between that, that the path takes, right? So maybe this is just complicated path you take, but at any given time, you know the state variable. So in principle, I could integrate this. In a discontinuous process, all I know is the beginning and the end. And I have no idea what the path is taken. There isn't anything fundamental about this, right? This is really how we as humans classify what I can figure out about my process. If I have something that sort of behaves quite homogeneously, I'll call it continuous quasi-static. 
if I can't figure out what's going on, I'm going to call it discontinuous. So let me give you an example. If, if I had a gas in a piston expanding, right? And again, here's the internal pressure. Here's the uh, external pressure. So this is the piston. And I make the piston very heavy so that its displacement is very slow. Then this gas, so let's say PI is higher than P naught. So this gas is going to expand because the piston is really, really heavy. It's only going to move really slowly. So at any given time, this gas is homogeneous. So I know exactly what P and V is. So this is a quasi-static process, right? Inside, and I'm going to be slightly vague deliberately, inside the material is sort of in some kind of quasi equilibrium. And, and, and if you don't know what that means, just don't worry about it, but it's, it behaves homogeneously. If this were an infinitely light piston, then as soon as I would let it go, it would sort of jump and there would be a kind of turbulent expansion here, right? And I wouldn't be able to define the pressure at any given instant, so then I have a discontinuous process. You can do the same argument with temperature where, you know, if you have, say, a reaction that builds up, that goes really fast and that builds up heat, uh, but if that temperature is homogeneous in the system, then you can still define the temperature. If it's like an explosive reaction where I have different temperatures everywhere uh, in the system, I would have a hard time defining a state of the system. Um, sometimes people define a third category uh, of process which is basically one plus in equilibrium with the environment. And later we'll see this is called a reversible process, but that's not really a categorization you make, that's more a conclusion that comes from the fact that it's in equilibrium with the environment. So a quasi-static process in equilibrium with the environment we will later see is a reversible process. Um, but this, Distinction is not particularly meaningful at this point because um, I don't know, what do you think? Is this process in equilibrium with the environment? I, I want you to think uh, maybe like 10 seconds about that. And I'm gonna help you. There's sort of no right or wrong answer here. Remember this process, I have a high pressure inside the piston low pressure outside, the piston is really heavy. Let's just make it infinitely heavy, right? Let's go to the limit. Is this, is this a process in equilibrium? I'm gonna drink my coffee while you think. How about somebody takes a guess? Don't be shy. You know, this is how we learn. I mean, we could vote, right? Okay, let's vote. Who votes that this is an equilibrium? Raise your hand on your, you can raise your hand or you can raise the hand in the chat window, right? Like, you know, the, you can do the thumbs up or whatever. Who thinks this is equilibrium? Nobody. I miss anybody? Okay, who thinks it's not in equilibrium? Okay, we have more votes for non-equilibrium. And I think we have some people abstaining too, but that's okay. Okay, well, you know, you are, you know that saying, you're all winners, right? Okay, you're all winners. Um, this is Vegas. You're all winners because it depends on your perspective. You know, if I draw my boundary here, It's a little hard to see. I sort of just cut through the piston or take the inside surface of the piston. You know, Newton says that, you know, action is equal to reaction, right? So the force, if you add up the force coming from this pressure and the piston, that's exactly the force uh, equivalent to the inside pressure. So if you are the gas inside, you feel exactly 
as a response force on the piston the same pressure that you have, which means you feel like you're in equilibrium, right? If you do mechanics on this thing, right, you can actually calculate that the pressure from the piston coming back is exactly the inside pressure. But if I now take my boundary here, it's not a good week for pens. This one's dead, this one's dead, this one's wet, this one's wet. Okay. Um, if I put the boundary here, right, then I'm not in equilibrium because I have a high pressure here and I have a low pressure there. So clearly the forces are not balanced. If you don't understand this, it's okay. We're gonna come back to this and this is more like a way to warm up your mind. Um, whether you are in equilibrium with the environment or not really just depends on how you define your environment, right? Here I define the environment as the outside. Here I define the environment as the piston pushing back on me. And the gas doesn't know the difference. And what are we really saying? The non-equilibrium piece of this sits in the piston. It doesn't have anything to do with the gas. I mean, let's wake up for a second and forget any thermo I taught you. Where does the non-equilibrium, where does the dissipation happen? It happens in the piston that's gonna do friction against the wall, right? As it accelerates, that's where the non-equilibrium. So if you are the gas inside, if you are the gas, you have no idea about the difference between one and three. The gas doesn't know this. The fact whether it is reversible, which means an equilibrium, as we'll see later when we do entropy, right, only relates to the larger environment. Um, again, uh, for some of you, this will probably be confusing, maybe actually for all of you, um, but it will, it will get your mind ready for when we solve this problem. Okay, so let's go back now to the bicycle tire because there was a little more going on than I told you. Return to the tire. There are actually two expansions in the tire. And I only told you about one. Let me draw a big fat tire. So here's a valve in the tire. And as I let air out, some volume element here, right? I'll call that one. So that volume element, uh, the pressure drops. Right? and PV is NRT, if N goes down, P goes down, because in first approximation, the tire has a fixed volume. So as air leaves, the pressure drops. And that pressure drop means that this volume element of gas expands. But there's another expansion across the valve, because when the pressure arrives here, I should really draw this, a valve just doesn't stick through the tire, right? A valve sticks. So when the pressure arrives as it comes in the valve, it has to be decompressed to the outside atmosphere, right? So P outside is one atmosphere, but at most times, except at the very end, the pressure of the gas coming in the valve is much higher than one atmosphere. So there's a second expansion, which is a pressure drop across the valve. And we didn't say anything about that last time. What we calculated was the, the, the drop in temperature of the gas inside the tire, but maybe the valve modifies it. So let's see how we can calculate what actually happens uh, for the pressure drop across the valve. So the reason I gave you this preamble that in the valve, we cannot actually define a trajectory for the gas because, you know, we have no idea how this expansion in the valve occurs. 
It may be extremely turbulent. I don't know if work's being delivered or not. So whenever you cannot figure out a trajectory for your system, there is always the same solution. You open your eyes and you take a bigger perspective. So let me draw that with a cartoon. If you cannot define the trajectory of your system here, right, then just make your system bigger. And if you make your system bigger, you will have easier changes to look at at the boundary than inside. And you just know less detail about your system. So let me show you that with the valve. So the solution to this problem, if you cannot define, so when you, let me write this out because it's kind of important. It will become very important when we do equilibrium radar. When one cannot, define a path for the system, just take larger system boundaries, move to larger system boundaries. So when I looked at what happens in the tire, I looked at a small volume of element of gas. Now instead what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the valve itself as the system. Right? That's definitely a larger system, right? Rather than looking at an element of gas going through the valve, I'm looking at the valve as a whole. So let's make a picture of the valve. This is the valve. There's sort of P in, that's the gas coming in. Then there's P out, and I'm going to assume that P out is um, um, atmospheric pressure. So this is now a very different system, right? This is an open system. I have mass flows. So I'll work with infinitesimal mass flow. So I'll have delta N in and delta N out, OK? And I'm going to assume a steady state operation. So there is no accumulation of mass in the valve. So in steady state, DNI is equal to DNO, right? So the amount of stuff going in the valve has to be the amount of gas coming out. So let me write the first law for the valve applied to the valve. So the change in energy of the valve is equal to what? It's equal to, um, any heat flow exchange with the valve, right? Delta Q. I'm also flowing energy in, right? So because I'm mass flowing, so that brings with it some internal energy. So that's the specific internal energy of the gas coming in times the amount of stuff I bring in. So I'm being inconsistent here, right? So let's just call it I for in. And then I have stuff coming out, specific energy of the gas going out times delta N out, but that's not everything, right? And this is where the mechanical engineers are uh, ahead of us, the rest of us. There is actually work associated with pushing the gas in, right? So if you think of the inlet here, you are pushing gas in. So you are doing work times displacement, right? The force would be the pressure times the area. And the displacement would be the DL as you push stuff in. So you can easily show that what that means is that the work coming in is the pressure in times the, vol the volume that you push in, 
And that's the specific volume times delta n i. And then you have the same on the outlet. The valve pushes gas out. So I have minus p out, p out, delta n out. OK? So that is the first law applied to the valve. It looks very different than what we've done before, but it's because we've taken a very different system definition. OK, now let's add some assumptions to this. So we're going to assume that the valve is in steady state. Right. So what that means is the valve itself is not changing. You don't really want it to change, right? It's a device. You don't want it to change. Um, and if you're in steady state, then the gas inside the valve is not changing at any given time. So then this is equal to zero. Sorry. It's a very bad day for pens to survive. OK, so this is 0 because of steady state. If you cannot read orange, I don't know. Can you read orange? I get a plus and I get a maybe. OK, you can shout out if you can't read it. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can find blue. It seems like all my red pens have died overnight. OK, if you're steady state, then this is 0. I'm also going to make the adiabatic approximation. So I'm going to set this equal to 0. And again, that's to look at a limiting assumption, right? I want to know what happens to the temperature of the gas. Let's say the, the temperature of the gas were to go up in the valve. Then if I don't take the adiabatic assumption, if heat could flow, right, then some heat would flow out. And therefore, the temperature rise wouldn't be as much. If the temperature were to drop in the valve, then heat would flow into the valve and again would mitigate that to some extent. So by setting del Q equal to zero, I'm kind of making, I want to figure out what the limiting assumption is. Okay, so uh, that's zero, that's zero. Anything else we can make zero? No. Okay, then let's keep on cranking. So what this means is uh, now because all these things are zero, I can get rid of all these things, right? Because they're all the same. So U in, plus P, oh, I'm always writing in, okay? I plus PI VI is equal to UO plus PO VO. Okay, let me rearrange that. That means that UI minus UO, so the difference in internal energy of the incoming and the outcoming gas has to equal P I V I minus P O V O. Okay. For an ideal gas, what is this? For an ideal gas, the energy difference only depends on temperature. So this is C V times uh, T I T in minus T out. And what is this? Well, I can use the ideal gas equation on this, right? P V is R T. So this is minus R, I think I made an error, right? Yeah, this is O minus I, right? O minus I, put that there, that goes there, and that goes there, right? Okay, so this is minus R times TI minus TO. Going to hunt for another color pen. Maybe I can use orange to box things. What's the solution to that? CV is a number, R is a number, they're not the same. So the only possible solution is that this is zero, right? So delta T has to be zero. So Ti has to equal To. So in this expansion, this completely different expansion actually there is no temperature difference. So 
we have a strange thing here, right? We have two adiabatic expansions. In the first one, the temperature goes down. In the second one, nothing happens to the temperature. By the way, this has a name. This is called a Joule-Thomson expansion. So think about that. And maybe one, somebody of you can explain this to me in like normal people's terms, not like getting lost in the equations. So, so what's going on here? Anyone want to give it a shot? We're drinking coffee at the same time, some of us. There you go, Sante. Anybody want to give it a try? What's the difference? What's the fundamental difference here between the adiabatic reversible expansion that I did in the beginning and the Joule Thompson expansion? You have a work contribution from the pressures, from the pressure drop. Yeah. Right on, right. So in in the adiabatic expansion, right, the gas element increases so in volume so work leaves the system right so work leaves the system that means delta u is negative therefore t drops right in the joule thompson expansion essentially the expansion work because of turbulence com is completely fed back into the system and so the expansion work goes back into the system. So delta U is constant. Therefore, delta T is zero. So it's because in the tire, right, we've assumed that when a, a gas volume element displaces, that work essentially gets delivered to the valve, right? It gets delivered to pushing gas out. If I have turbulent expansion, then the work all gets internally dissipated in these kind of gradients that I showed you here before. So the work stays in the system. That means there's no energy change, so there's no temperature change, okay? So why am I spending so much time on this, right? Because I, I you know, you people are my last hope for thermodynamics, right? You're in a graduate course on thermodynamics. Uh, most people do not understand thermodynamics. They do not understand how to apply it. I mean, they understand the equations, right? Everybody can integrate PDV. But the beauty of thermodynamics, when you understand its application, right? And the context that you have to see here is, right, that what we have calculated is two limiting values, right? We have calculated, um, what happens in an adiabatic expansion when all the work leaves, and we've calculated when none of the work leaves. And depending on how this expansion is done in reality, whether you know it's a big system, a small system, you probably live in between somewhere, right? So this bicycle tire, uh, you know, one of the reasons I didn't get a cold burn of the gas coming out, remember we calculated that in the limiting case, it would be like minus 70 Celsius or something. But, uh, some of the reasons why that's not minus 70 is A, that I talked about, right? There's probably heat transfer with the rim. If you have a really large system, that goes away, right? If you have a really large system, then the surface to volume effect makes any kind of transfers on the boundary small. That's why the stuff when air rises up a mountain, those are large energy masses. Uh, they don't have heat transfer from the outside. But internally, there is some dissipation Right? And that's also probably what goes on in the tire, where work gets internally dissipated and that keeps the temperature up. If I wanted to do this with the tire, if I wanted to have a better adiabatic expansion, I would just do it slower, right? If I had a valve that would say very slowly uh, leak air, right? Then uh, inside the valve, the expansion would probably be quite reversible and work would get extracted. But of course, if I do it slower, then I have a problem with heat transfer, right? So in some sense, the limit of a perfect adiabatic system would be 
a large system, so your surface to volume uh, is small, and that you slowly expand or contract, right? And then you have the full uh, energy transfer to the outside. Okay, let's see how well you understood this. Here's a little problem. I have an adiabatic box. So it's insulated from the environment. It's a fixed shape. Here I have some pressure. Here I have P equals zero. I pull the partition. My question is, what is delta T? And it's an ideal gas. What happens to the temperature? I feel so tempted to like, just ask one of you, but that would be mean, right? Did somebody raise their hand? Come on, give me a break here. Oh, you pull it out quickly to the side rather than moving it this way? Yeah, I'm just, imagine it's like a door that I pull. Mm -hmm. Right, so I just pull it out. Done. What happens to the temperature? No change. We have a vote for no change. Science is a democracy. What do we decide collectively? Science, unfortunately, is not a de democratic process. But Does anybody want to vote differently? You're absolutely right. There's no change. And how do you know that? So you might be tempted to focus on what goes on here and you know is there like a this thing is expanding and you know well there's nothing here so there's nothing being compressed but it's a much simpler solution right i look at the box as a whole what's the energy change of the box as a whole well it's rigid so there's no work being done on the box right and it's insulated so they're both zero so delta U of the box is zero. That means delta T of the gas has to be zero, right? So this is all the beauty of thermodynamics, right? If you take the right system boundaries, you can often make a, a, a very simple and easy statement, right? Imagine that you never learned thermodynamics, right? I don't know what you would do. Maybe you would like use fluid mechanics to figure out and solve blow 500 million hours of CPU time to solve turbulent differential equations to figure out that the answer is zero, right? And so a system level analysis shows you that, right? Okay. Um, keep in mind that Uh, keep in mind that uh, the Joule-Thomson expansion result that delta T is zero is only true for an ideal gas. Um, you, you should go and look back at that, where that appears, but for a non-ideal gas, that's not necessarily true. There can be a temperature change. Okay. The last thing I have to do to finish the first law is to talk about enthalpy. which is uh, the first auxiliary function. Uh, enthalpy H is defined as U plus PV. And so, because U is a property, so a state function, P and V are state variables, this is also a state function, right? So in any given state of the system, the enthalpy is fully defined. Or as we would say differently, it's differential is path independent. So uh, why enthalpy? Uh, it's because uh, we often work in constant pressure environments. 
Uh, and in constant pressure environments, when you do changes to systems, you often have this PDV term, right? Um, and so if you, if you sort of bring a system, say from a state one to a state two, if you want to calculate the heat flow, right, to, to, to do that, it would be delta U minus W. And if you only have PDV work, that's delta U plus P delta V. Right, and it's, it's kind of annoying, right, because we think of U as the internal energy. Well, it is the internal energy. And the heat you need to move a system in phase space, right, between different temperatures, between different phases of materials, uh, has that delta U term, but it also has the P delta V term. And to combine them, we actually define the uh, uh, enthalpy. So you could, in principle, tabulate changes in U between states and changes in V and then always plus, plug this in, but it's easier to tabulate the enthalpy. So the use of the enthalpy is mainly for uh, three reasons. Um, it's sometimes called the heat function, and I'll show you in a second why that is. Uh, similarly, this should really be 1B, I guess, but I'll call it 2. Uh, it's used to calculate heat of reactions and of phase transformations, in particular in materials. And you've heard about this, right? Enthalpy of melting, etc. And then three, if you're a mechanical engineer, you know that it's also the energy that is associated with flowing matter. And I'll explain each of these in more detail. An example of flowing matter is what I showed with the valve, right? It's sort of moving matter in or out of a device. Okay. Why is it called the heat function? Uh, if you take the differential of H, so the H is, um, so I take the, the differential of this expression here, the H is the U plus PDV plus VDP. Right? It's taking the differential of a product. The U is del Q plus del W. Now under the condition that if delta W is equal to minus PDV, so this is a condition I'm imposing here, right? That there is only PDV work, then dH is del Q plus VDP. Which means if I evaluate this under so evaluate under constant pressure. I get that dH, the differential of H under constant pressure is the heat flow under constant pressure and under constant pressure, of course, dP is zero. So, so what we've shown is that for a constant pressure process, the heat flow in the process can be calculated simply by the change in enthalpy of the state of the system. Okay, that's what this statement uh, makes here, which you can now see why it's called the heat function sometimes, right? You could almost think of it as the enthalpy is, is raised or lowered simply by heat flow in or out. Again, there are two conditions here, right? This is only two under constant pressure. And in this case, this is only true when the work term is only minus PDV. So not when I have electrical work and magnetic work, uh, et cetera. Well, we'll see later that uh, the constant pressure condition uh, is kind of universal, but if we have other work terms, we can write a generalized enthalpy um, that is still a heat function. Okay. Um,
because the enthalpy contains energy, right? The, it's defined as U plus PV. Energy has an arbitrary reference state. There is no zero of energy. Um, uh, the enthalpy has an arbitrary reference state. So uh, the reference states that pick that is picked is the elements in their pure states, uh, in their, well, they're pure by definition of their element, in their stable state at 298 Kelvin and a pressure of one atmosphere. So there, the enthalpy is set to zero. And then for compounds, Uh, the enthalpy is defined by what's called the formation energy, sorry, formation enthalpy. Which is the heat of reaction. At 298K, one atmosphere. So, to give you an example, if you had um, carbon plus oxygen going to CO2, then what you would do, you would start at 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere, so you would take these at 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere, you would let them react, and of course, because this is like burning coal, right? They wouldn't stay at 298 Kelvin, but you'd wait until they come back, to, to, until the product comes back to 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere. And the heat flow measured in that reaction would be the enthalpy of formation of the CO2, okay? Which in this case um, would be negative, right? Um, since it's the heat function, right, since it's, as I've shown here, uh, the amount of heat you have to put in to create a change on the constant pressure, you can look specifically at the enthalpy as a function of temperature. So how much do you have to change the enthalpy to raise or lower the temperature at constant pressure? So for that, I can put in what this is, right? So the H at constant pressure is del Q at constant pressure, and that's NCPDT for a simple system. That's what we saw last time, right? Whereas the DT is taken at constant pressure. Um, so I'm gonna do a mathematical oddity, I'm di dividing by differentials, which the math department tells you you can't do, but yes, you can, unless they're like, uh, their limits are, are, um, are divergent. So what is this? This is the H, the differential of H at constant P divided by the differential of T at constant P. So that's the partial derivative, right? So this is by definition, the H dT at constant P. And so what I've proven here is that that is equal to CP. Uh, I have an N in front, but I'm gonna get rid of the N by normalizing the H, right? So I take H per mole, so then the N goes away. So the temperature derivative of the heat capacity at constant pressure is the, is the heat capacity. Kind of an important result. So since heat capacity is always positive, We'll prove that later, but you know that if, if heat capacity were negative, 
it's kind of a fun exercise. We would live in a weird, weird world. You should actually try to figure out what's gone. You know, if heat capacity is negative, you could sort of get spontaneous splitting of, of temperature, right? But anyway, but you could have like room temperature splitting into low temperature and high temperature. So anyway, you should think about that. Um, so if you plot the enthalpy as a function of temperature for a typical material, Let's take an element, right? I don't know, aluminum, whatever. So somewhere here is 298 Kelvin. So I would start at zero there just by definition. This thing would go up. The slope would be the heat capacity in the solid state. At some point I have a phase transformation. So let's say this is the melting point. So at the phase transformation, I have to put the latent heat in. So that makes the enthalpy rise. So This here would be the enthalpy of melting. Then I would continue. This is not necessarily a straight line because the slope is the heat capacity, but the heat capacity may be temperature dependent, right? So this is now CP of the liquid state. And at some point, this thing would evaporate or boil, right? T-boiling. And so now I have delta H of boiling and I'm running out of board space. So because of course then here I would continue the enthalpy and this would be CP of the vapor. And I didn't draw this very well because in reality enthalpies of boiling are much larger than enthalpies of melting. So this should be much larger um, than this. Okay, uh, let me show you some data. Again, in the um, spirit of knowing numbers. What? Okay, sorry, technical difficulties, but we should be there. Um, I put in the notes um, in the PowerPoint slide some original old style references of where you can find lots of enthalpy of compounds if you need them. Uh, the Janoff tables are among the best source uh, of enthalpy. And uh, these days, and so uh, Kubachevsky's book has a great table for basic compounds too which is like shown here. So for example, this is the enthalpy at 298 for all these compounds and it's pages and pages. But these days people just look them up online. And um, one of my favorites of course is the materials project, uh, which Christine Pearson leads, but I'm part of, uh, because that actually shows you computed enthalpies for compounds, uh, but actually in many cases has the experimental data. And the second best is the NIST chemistry web book, which has very well curated enthalpy data. Uh, it's unfortunately its coverage is kind of uh, spotty sometimes. It's it's broad, so it has organic, inorganic stuff in it, but then there's like whole pieces missing sometimes. Okay, so I want to show you some typical numbers. Um, so heats of sort of simple elemental phase transitions, I've shown here for um, a few typical elements, right? So uh, what you should remember is that enthalpies of melting, right, are kind of in the 10 kilojoule per mole range. Um, I mean, they span here, sodium is one of the lowest one, tungsten goes a lot higher. But I want you to know that it's kind of like 10 and not 10,000 kilojoules per mole. Um, and uh, the way to think about this is sort of like, think of EVs. Um, uh, you know, one EV per atom is how much? One EV per atom is, a, is approximately 100 kg, right, per mole. It's essentially the Faraday constant, right? Faraday comes to 96,000, whatever, blah, 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 right? So um, what's a typical bonding of materials? Like, you know, solids like metals and oxides is in the multiple EV range. 
right? So multiple hundreds of kilojoules. And what you see is that the enthalpy of melting is only a very small fraction of that, right? And that's basically because you, you don't really destroy bonds in melting. You kind of rearrange them. But so if you take, for example, aluminum, the, um, the cohesive energy is, pro is several electron volts, so several, several hundreds of kilojoules per mole. But the enthalpy of melting is a very small fraction of that, which is kind of remarkable, right? So what that's telling you is a melt is still extremely cohesive in terms of cohesive energy. On the other hand, if you look at the enthalpy of vaporization is much larger, right? Uh, now you're talking about, in many cases, hundreds of kilojoules per mole. And the reason is that when you evaporate things, you're kind of breaking all the bonds and you, this is now of the order of the cohesive energy. So for those of you who think in electron volts, right, this is now multiple electron volts per atom, which is the scale of cohesive uh, energies. Um, there are uh, rules of thumb, empirical rules. Uh, I want to say something about empirical rules. Um, you know, every time before I teach this class, I read the comments back from the students from the two or three years before, just to get me in the spirit. Um, somebody complained that, that the rules of thumbs were not accurate. And that's why they're rules of thumb, right? They're just like to get you, make you guess a ballpark. Um, a, a commonly used rule is Richard's rule, which says that uh, for elemental solids, for elemental solids, the enthalpy of melting is approximately nine times the melting point. So that's when you put the melting point in Kelvin, and this is in joules, right? Um, similarly, uh, there is what's called Trouton's rule, which is that the enthalpy of boiling is approximately 90 times the, the boiling point. And again, this would be in Kelvin and this would be in joules, right? And this is, this is really, I would say, reasonably true for elemental solids. Uh, for compounds, it's not too far off. But when you get to sort of complex molecular solids, like you're melting, I don't know, um, a crystal of methane, uh, this is probably not true anymore. It's actually not true, not probably. Okay. Um, enthalpy changes in phase transformations are actually a lot smaller. So I, I, I'm, I'm giving you a few examples here. And uh, for example, for iron, right? Iron, as you know, has uh, three phases. Uh, iron has a low temperature uh, BCC, then it transforms to FCC, and then it transforms to BCC again at higher temperature. But the enthalpy changes here are only of the order of uh, one kilojoule per mole. So this is very small, right? So one kilojoule per mole, how much is that in EV? So that is roughly about 10 milli electron volt per atom. That's remarkable, right? That's remarkably small. So the, the cohesive energy of iron is several electron volts. But what I'm saying is if I just rearrange the bonds from FCC to BCC, I'm only changing a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that. Like in this case, uh, 10 milli electron volt. So there's two things you have to remember about this. One is that um, the energy difference or enthalpy difference more exactly between phases is extremely small. It's like a really competitive world being a crystal. Um, and you know, my old advisor had a comparison. He says, um, if you try to get the energy difference of say BCC and, and FCC or in general two phases by calculating the cohesive energy, it's like trying to get the weight of a ship captain by weighing the ship with the captain and without the captain. We should take an oil tanker. So this difference is an extremely small fraction of the total cohesive energy. The other thing is that Look at the transition temperatures. They're in the order of 1,000 degrees. But what is 10 MeV in KT? That's like uh, 100 Kelvin or something like that, right? Because room temperature is 25 MeV. 
So this stuff that people sometimes say that a transition occurs when the energy difference is of the order of KT, this is completely unsubstantiated, right? And people use these arguments in science all the time and the data speaks against it, right? Here you have a tiny energy difference or enthalpy difference, 10 MeV, that's 100 Kelvin, but the phase transition occurs at 1000 Celsius, right? So, so keep that in mind, right? You know, in material science, people make up stuff all the time because we're not a very quantitative field and, and you should be better at that, okay? This is why I'm trying to do this. Okay, so if you go to um, uh, oxides, for example, here's an example for zirconium. The uh, zirconium has three different phases, tetragonal, monoclinic, and cubic. The difference between tetragonal and monoclinic is about six kilojoules per mole. So a little higher, but still small, right? Um, I've shown another example here, silver iodide, again, six kilojoules per mole, so order 50, 60 um, uh, MeV. Okay. So, when when we talk about the enthalpy of a phase transition, there are two components to that. So if I go from a phase one to a phase two, right, when P is constant, so the delta H which is the, the heat of the transformation, is delta U um, plus P delta V. And again, right, so it's because if the two phases have different volume, there's work being done or received from the environment. So I have a poll. I want you to guess what, how big this contribution is. So look at the poll. Is the poll launched? Okay. You have five choices. And so I'm asking about solid to solid phases, right? So I don't know, maybe, you know, iron BCC going to FCC or cubic zirconia going to tetragonal zirconia. Is it one EV per mole? Is it 10 to the minus three joule per mole? Is it 0.1 joule per mole? Is it a hundred joule per mole? Or is it 10 kilojoules per mole? Okay, I'll give you 20 seconds. This is kind of fun. I can live see people answering. It's way too much fun. Sorry, this takes more time than in class. We just do people raise hands, but I feel like I'm part of the elections here. Okay, I think we got 84% of you voted, that's better than in the election, so good job. Okay, um, most of you voted for 100 joules per mole. I'm not gonna give you the answer, let's try to figure it out. So the most um, likely response is 100 joule per mole, that's the winner. Uh, the second one is 0.1 joule per mole. Okay, let's try to calculate it. Let's estimate what P delta V is. So if I take a metal, Right, like titanium, copper, what is a typical molar volume of a metal? What's the scale of a mole, you know, how big is a mole of a metal? Are we talking like cubic meters? Are we talking like cubic nanometers? I mean, right, scale of a metal, molar volume is cc's, right? So uh, a typical molar volume is in the range of a few cc's. So let's for the argument use 10 cc per mole. And if you want real numbers, I looked them up for you. Titanium is 10.6 cc's per mole. So cc's is cubic centimeter, right? A copper, being a later transition metal and smaller, right? So it's seven cc's per mole. So let's just take 10. So then the question is, that's the molar volume, but what is delta V? Like let's say for titanium, I can do a phase transition between, uh, titanium can be BCC or HEP. So 
typically it's actually only a few percent, but I'm going to estimate for now, let's estimate say 10% and we can come back to, okay. So that means delta V is about one CC per mole. So what is P delta V? So P delta V, the pressure is 10 to the fifth Pascals, right? That's Newton per meter squared times one CC per mole. And then I got to put this all in the right units, right? To get joules. Okay, so let's do that one time. 10 to the fifth Newton per meter squared. And CC is a cubic centimeters, right? So that's 10 to the minus six meters cubed per mole. And the winner is, so I got 10 to the fifth, 10 to the minus six. I got uh, meter squared, meter cubed, so that becomes Newton meter, so joules, so it's 0 0.1 joules. So in reality, it's probably even smaller because my delta V of 10% is on the high side. Volume differences between condensed phases, different solids or different liquids are usually only a few percent. So I guess what I'm saying here is that, yes, the, the heat, the change in enthalpy contains a contribution from the work exchange with the environment, but it's not big in general. Okay, so the biggest contribution of this delta H comes from the delta U, except, well, except when this term is big, right? So when is it big? When P is really large or where delta V is really large? So when is P really large? You know, when you're doing high pressure studies, for example, if you're a geologist, right? So sometimes we have geology students taking this class. You know, if you're looking at phase transformation in the core of the earth, uh, P is super large, right? This becomes really meaningful. When is delta V large? Delta V is typically only large in one type of transition that's boiling, right? If you evaporate stuff, the volume goes up dramatically, right? It goes up a thousand times the molar volume. So then this gets very large. And in the problem set, there is a problem where you're being asked to calculate the which fraction P delta V is of delta H for boiling of water. And you'll find, I think the fraction, it's like order 15% or 17% or something like that. So in that transition, because the delta V is large, um, this contribution to the enthalpy is uh, very substantial. The last thing is that I also said it's the work associated with flowing matter. So if you have a system and you put stuff in, so you put like mass in, and the system also pushes mass out. Then as I've shown you with the example of the valve, the energy in, so the energy that's being flowed in is not just the internal energy of the stuff coming in, but it's also the work for pushing this stuff in. So it's plus the pressure in times the volume that I push in. And so what that really means, it's the enthalpy of the stuff I put in. And similarly, the energy out would be the enthalpy of the stuff being pushed out. So what you see is that when I move stuff in or out of a system, you shouldn't just count the energy, you should count the pressure by which it pushed in or out. So that's the enthalpy uh, in or out. <clears throat> 
Um, and this is why, again, if you're a mechanical engineer, you work with devices that, um, uh, that do exactly this, right? For example, and you make enthalpy balances. Let's say you have a, turbi a turbine, right? You have stuff coming in. You have stuff going out. When you make an enthalpy balance of this thing, let me extend the axis. So when you look at stuff across this brown boundary, right? What do you see? I see enthalpy coming in. I see enthalpy coming out and I see work. Let's say I'm running a turbine. I see work coming out. Maybe there's heat, but normally you try to uh, run a turbine adiabatically. So if you write the energy balance of this thing, you would have H in minus H out plus W equals zero. And what that means is W is equal to H out minus H in. So in some sense, mechanical engineering consists of mostly of enthalpy exchanging machines, right? So I have some, let's say I'm running a turbine, you know, steam would come in. So something with very high enthalpy, uh, steam at lower pressure would come out or in some cases even condensed steam, but normally not normally steam at lower pressure. So the enthalpy is lower. So H out minus H in, right? is a negative quantity. So W is a negative quantity. That means this machine is able to, to deliver work to the environment, which is what you want out of a turbine, right? So mechanical engineers can analyze turbines like this, uh, compressors, um, evaporators. Um, uh, they think of all these things as um, enthalpy exchangers. Okay. Um, so that's it for uh, the first law.